Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for the singing group, uh, for leading us um, at the beginning of our worship time. And good morning to you. Welcome to our service this morning. It's really great, wonderful uh, to see you all. A special welcome to any visitors that might be with us this morning. The season is still very much the Easter season. I just want to remind you that just before Jesus died on the cross, he spoke his very last words from the cross, and his last words were, it is finished. It is finished. He wasn't saying that because it was finished and, and, and something had failed, the whole thing had failed. It was saying, it is finished because my work is complete. My work has reached the successful conclusion I planned from the beginning of, of time, before all creation had begun. And so God accepted the perfect, wonderful sacrifice of his, of his one and only perfect son, received that, and he was resurrect, resurrected back to life on Easter day. And that's why we celebrate, not just in the Easter season, but all seasons we celebrate uh, his victory over death and sin. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord over heaven, over earth, over creation. He's the beginning and the end, life and death. Jesus is Lord. And we're going to hear those words sung to us, actually. Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaimed it. You'll see the words on our white insert sheet. Uh, the music group are going to lead us in our worship. Sadly, we can't sing as yet, but let's reflect on the words as we hear them sung. And, let, and you can hum, you can hum. So go for it. Hum as loud as you like. Uh, that's, that's okay, but uh, let's now worship God in our hearts as we as we hear these words Jesus is Lord creation's voice proclaims it thank you The Lord be with you. And also this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and Lord, speak to us. That we may hear your word. 
move among us. Receive our prayers. As the heading says, this we move into a time of confession. Confession is a time of repentance. Repentance is not just a time of being sorry for the things that we have said or done wrong. It's also a time of being sorry for the kind of person I am. Renew a right spirit within us, is what the psalmist says. Only God can deal with the evil and the sin in our hearts. So let us confess that sin and evil as we say together with one voice. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus Christ who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant us to help each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May the God of love and the God of power forgive us and free us from all our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in christ jesus our lord amen let's say together almighty father who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen lord give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is the Lord. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy. And in our song we will praise our God. Let's stand and say the, the Venite, the words there written on our service sheet, Psalm 95. Let's praise God as we share and say and proclaim these words together. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountain are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Amen. Would you like to be seated, please, as we're now going to hear our first reading, which Judith is going to read for us. Thank you. Today's reading is from the Gospel of St Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. 
Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you whilst I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are the witnesses of these things. This is the gospel, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we heard there, the scriptures were being read and unfolded uh, in their understanding uh, by Jesus to his followers, to the disciples. And we're going to continue now with um, reading and listening and, and, and embracing the word of God and the truths therein contained. And we're going to do that by turning to our white colored insert sheets and reading together Psalm 4. And let's do this uh, antiphonally. The church is uh, side by side. So, Rachel, if you start that side, please, uh, with verse 1. And then we'll answer, we'll respond with verse 2. So we'll be reading this um, in harmony and together. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when there grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Stephen is now going to bring to us our second reading. Thank you. <clears throat> Readings from Acts chapter 3 and verses 12 to 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has made him, has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, 
as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Oh, Steve and I are very privileged that we happened to kick a holiday that we had booked for Christmas down to last week. So we've just been allowed out for a whole week and it's been really exciting. A bit cold, but really exciting. <laughs> um, so today's reading is looking at the Acts chapter. And um, I love these sermons at the beginning of Acts. I think of them as hot off the press sermons because they're before anyone had really agonized over working out all the theology of the Trinity hadn't been figured out yet. That these things were really the work of the church fathers who really um, sought to think deeply, if you like, into what had been revealed about who Christ was. But everything hadn't been all worked out like that. The commentaries weren't available yet. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. It's being written, if you like, in the lives of these men as they're um, experiencing the risen Christ. And uh, you see in Luke 24, when um, Jesus came and spoke to them, and it says he opened their minds to the understanding that in a sense it had to be after the cross when they met with the risen Jesus that Jesus could really begin to properly teach them, you know, what the whole plan had been throughout scripture. And there's another whole sermon about that. Um, and in this situation, we've just had a wonderful thing take place um, in the temple courts and coming into the temple to pray um, as was their normal habit um, Peter and John how many of you are singing a song now <laughs> is it just me <laughs> Peter and John went to pray <laughs> they met a lame man on the way he asked for arms and held out his palms and this is what Jesus Peter did say and Peter said to the man we haven't got any money, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. <laughs> and he went walking and leaping and praising God. You can stop now. <laughs> and that had just taken place in the temple courts. And it says that just before... Um, and Peter responds. So he hasn't sat down and carefully worked out his sermon. Um, he's responding in a sense. I, I believe that he's getting understanding even as he's going in a lot of these sermons. It's, like I said, it's hot off the press. He's beginning to, he's, he's um, a man now filled with the Holy Spirit and, it, and things are firing off and he's beginning to understand the fullness of what's taken place. And, I don't know if you've found this, but um, when you walk with God and you think you kind of have an idea of what he's done in your life, and as you keep walking with him, you actually find, oh, actually, he's doing something bigger, he's doing something greater, he's doing something, and the significance of it just keeps growing. And um, you, you sometimes find it hard to take in. You know, you, you think you've, so many times, and this might just be me, but so many times I think I've got it all worked out. <laughs> and I know the limits and I know what it looks like. You know, and it might be partly because um, t teaching is part of my gifting and that's what teachers do all the time. They're, they're, thinking, they're thinking through, what does this mean? What does this look like? How does this make a difference for our lives? Um, and, um, and yet it's always, always growing. And you have this wonderful bit where it says, um, everybody was filled with awe because of what had taken place in the temple. And then Peter says to them, men of Israel, so he's speaking to Jews, and that's quite important when you're reading Acts, to look at who they're preaching to, because they preach a bit differently when they preach to Jews to when they preach to Gentiles, because they're expecting Jews 
to understand all their heritage about the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They don't have the same expectation for Gentiles and they come at a different, they come from a different place. Um, so he's speaking to Jews. They haven't even got the idea about Gentiles coming in yet. That's, that's still to be discovered a few chapters on. And he says, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? I love that phrase. And so they're, they're very clear. They're saying, why are you looking at us? as if we could do anything, as if we could make somebody walk. We're, we're, we're nobodies, if you like. We're just a couple of guys. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is glorifying his servant, Jesus. And they go on to preach. And basically, I mean, he's, he's not very, I was going to say not very PC in his sermon. He's quite in your face. He's like, God has glorified your servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. And to this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, that's the name of Jesus, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So he doesn't hold back. <laughs> he's quite, he's very clear when he speaks. First of all, he says, look, we haven't done anything. Don't you go putting us on a pedestal. Don't you go making us... Um, the great healers. That's not who we are. We are witnesses of the power of Jesus. And it's the name of Jesus that's, that's produced this, what's the word it says? This perfect health. So they describe Jesus as the author of life, the holy and righteous one, whom they, I was gonna say unfortunately, that's slightly too, not a not strong enough word, whom they had deliberately put to death, whom they had exchanged for a murderer, which is like, oh, the irony of it. You took the author of life and you gave him up so that you could have freed to you a taker of life, a murderer. And if you remember, Jesus described Satan as a, a, a stealer, a destroyer. One who takes life. And what's interesting here is the setting of this talk is the temple. And in the Old Testament, when the temple was first dedicated, and I'm talking about Solomon's temple, when it was first dedicated as the tabernacle before it, it was created to house the glory of God. It was the central focus of the whole nation. And it was a place, forgiveness of sins didn't come in in the New Testament. Forgiveness of sins was offered in the Old Testament. And it was done through the temple, through the sacrificial system. God provided a way whereby, in a sense, heaven could meet earth. And it was, the, it was at the temple. That was a gift of God to them. It wasn't created to be... Um, fusty and no life in it. It was created to be a place of the very glory of God. And when Solomon prays, when he dedicates the temple that he'd just built, he prays this amazing prayer and he says, oh God, when we're defeated in battle, if we come here, may your eyes and ears hear our prayer. And um, turn back our enemies. If there's a plague um, or pestilence or famine and we come here to, may your eyes and ears hear and see the plight of your people and um, bring life and health. Um, if foreigners um, come here and seek your face, you know, their blessing, 
blessing go out to them. And so it was a place where, if you like, heaven met earth for Israel. And that was a gift of God. And, it, and God says, my name will live here. And it's the place where if you need forgiveness and you bring sacrifice in the prescribed way, if you need forgiveness, you will receive forgiveness. And even once a year, the cumulative sins of the nation were cleansed through, the, through atonement. Um, it was the place for forgiveness. It was a place that was meant to be a place of life and a place of blessing and a place of connection with the goodness of God for the nation. And unfortunately, over the centuries, it had become a place where if a miracle took place in its courts, it was extraordinary, amazing, unusual. And yet it was the place where these things, if you like, should have been part of what was happening all the time. It was the place that if you needed a miracle, that's where you would go. If you needed forgiveness, that's where you would go if you were a Jew. If you needed to meet with God, that would be where you would go. And what we're seeing here is we're actually witnessing a shift from God's glory, if you like, dwelling in the physical temple to God's glory dwelling, um, first of all, in the name of Jesus. But it, Jesus, as we know, was, the new, was a new temple. And he said, you can tear me down if you like. You can, tear, you can tear this temple down and in three days I'll rebuild it. But then there was another temple, a living temple of people who were believers and followers of Jesus. They were, they, were, they were now carrying the name of Jesus, carrying the glory of Jesus. And they, when they walked in that, when they followed Jesus, and in a sense that's what they were doing, they didn't have a plan, I don't think, that morning of like, how are we going to get everybody to believe us? I know, let's go to the courts and do a big healing ministry thing and everyone will come in. I believe they were just going about their walk with Jesus and what they did that day was they went to pray and as they went to pray they saw a man and we're not told why they did what they did next but something happened as they looked at the man and they thought yes let's give life this that Jesus wants to do something here and they passed on that life that they were carrying. And then there was chaos, as we just saw. <laughs> My lovely husband leaping about. There was chaos, there was leaping. There were people, the, the lame man then was clinging to Peter and John. There was life going on. Something was happening in the temple that hadn't been seen. And um, after this, you have the point where <laughs> The next chapter, when you have a look at what happened next, the next chapter is the captain of the temple and the Sadducees. They're like, what's this? This isn't, this isn't on the plan. This is disrupting our religious plan. And even in their giving of Jesus, when they handed over Jesus and betrayed him and gave him up to be crucified, they were trying to be spiritual. This is the bit that's a bit scary. <laughs> They weren't doing it because they thought, oh, this is God and we're evil and we're going to get rid of him. They were doing it because they truly believed that Jesus was, was undoing all their hard work at getting everybody to follow all the laws because they thought if you could follow all the laws, there's one theory from one of the groups, was that if we could follow every law, if every person in Israel could follow the law perfectly, all at once for one day, then the Romans, you know, then I can't remember who it was because the, the Messiah would come or the Romans would get kicked out. But you see, their whole focus was on if we can do this right, if we can get it right. And now Jesus comes along and they don't even recognize that he is the life that he is the author of life. They don't even recognize the God who wrote all the laws for them in the first place, who gave them the laws. They no longer recognize him. They're so intent on their plan and their way to be spiritual. And I think that's what God was saying to me when I was reading this, 
was, Sarah, which temple do you worship at? Because the new temple, if you like, the new place to meet with God and to meet and receive his life is the cross. Instead of the, so it's the action of Jesus. It's what he achieved on the cross that is our place where we receive life. This is what Peter is saying here. It's that you put him to death. As you were trying hard to be spiritual, you got it all wrong. And he has to face them with the fact, you've got this all wrong. And I love it afterwards, he says, brothers or friends, I know you did this in ignorance. I often wonder when I read the Gospels, would I have been a Pharisee? I often wonder, I wonder, would I have got what was going on? You know, and I, off, I usually come to the conclusion I probably wouldn't have. I think I probably would have been a Pharisee. I don't know, it's, I'll never know. <laughs> would I have been so fixated on trying to get it right that I'd lost the ability to see life when it was right in front of me? And even though we're believers, even if we are, we are believers, we can do the same. We can, we can have the encounter with God, we can meet with him, we can know his life, and then somewhere along the line, we get all focused on, am I doing the right things? Am I doing it right? And, and if, we need, if we have needs in our lives, sometimes we can start to think, oh, if I, if I just pray right or I fast right or I, I do something right or I find someone else who's spiritual to pray for me you know who's more spiritual than I am if I can just get it right and our focus kind of comes away from the amazing gift of the cross to what must I do I was reminded when I was thinking about this of I used to go on holiday with some friends who weren't Christians and I was very enthusiastic at the time and um, of course I'd be like um, I'd go away on holiday and, I, and I'd get up early and spend some time with God and everyone else was lying in so I could do that without being too bringing too much attention to myself and I remember on the Monday thinking to saying you know I was like really I'm praying for my friends you know <laughs> and and this is what I felt God was saying to me feel free to throw it out if you want to <laughs> because I thought it was a bit heretical at the time. He said to me, Sarah, will you just stop trying so hard to be Christian? <sighs> and I thought, he said, and, and I, you know, I was in that mode where if we were having a conversation about tiramisu, I was trying to think how to bring Jesus into it. Do, do, do you know what I mean? If we, if we were talking about the sun or, the, or anything, you know, how can I bring Jesus into this conversation? And God said to me, stop trying so hard because your trying is producing your idea of what you think. And they're meeting that idea. And the thing is, your idea of what's Christian and what's nice and what should be and what should work doesn't have any life in it. The life in you is in the messy bit behind. It's in your doubts and your struggles and your walk with Jesus which is sometimes wonderful and sometimes I was going to say terrible but <laughs> sorry if that's a bit alarming but sometimes it's hard going and sometimes I don't understand and sometimes I don't say the right thing or quite often sometimes I get cross and frustrated and upset and sometimes I'm depressed and I shouldn't be because I'm a Christian there's so many things that are not quite right and you think well if they just saw that that would be terrible, I'd never become a Christian. <laughs> what would happen then? Of course, so, but the thing is, it's in your reality that I have placed my life. And when you allow yourself to be who I've made you, who I, when you allow, where you have in reality encountered the cross, where you have witnessed the power of Jesus, in all sorts of little ways and in big ways. If you let people come close to that, they'd meet with the power of me. And if you trust that my name dwells in you, 
you trust that the author of life dwells in you. And when he wants to, he will, you can just become aware of those nudges and those conversations and those just openings and they happen from the from the life flowing out of us right at the end it says repent and turn back and that would have been also a really familiar message to Israel they had heard those messages before from prophets throughout the Old Testament and it meant you've gone off down a different road and it's time to come back to trusting in God it's time to come back to being who you're called to be who he's made the way for you to be and for the first time in this sermon, or one of the first times, it was you can find that at the cross. You can find that when you, in a sense, come in your brokenness before the cross of Christ. And there you find all the stuff we got wrong gets washed away by his blood. And it says in the next verse, which isn't which is actually the next episode, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And it's that, you know, if you like, letting go of the trying hard to be spiritual, which perhaps it's only me that does that, so I'm not sure. <laughs> and trusting that flow of life that's coming from the cross into our lives and out beyond, even in, in amongst our reality that doesn't always look perhaps like we think it should do but it's where the life is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful work of the cross and for the life that flows from it. And I pray for each and every one of the lovely people here and those who might be listening or watching on Zoom. I pray, Father, that the reality of the cross will loom large in our lives today and the grace and life that you have poured out from that place we can't make it happen lord but we come to you hungry and thirsty and ask for forgiveness where we need it where we've focused on our own abilities and we just want to receive the life you've made available through the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be really blessed. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. We're going to stand now and declare our faith, our common faith, in the words of the Nicene Creed. And as Sarah has reminded us, the cross is at the centre of our faith and what we believe, and it's at the centre of what we, what we say when we declare these words. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you be seated, please? We're going to listen to our next uh, reflection song. The words are in the white uh, folded sheets. And just as Sarah has uh, so rightly reminded us of the centrality of Jesus on the cross and what he achieved there, these words will take us to uh, that event and what happened. You know, we can get distracted by so many different things, can't we, when we, when we try to focus. But let's try to keep our focus in these next few moments on these words and on what the cross means to us and what Jesus has done for us, his wonderful, amazing, indescribable love and what he won for us on the cross. Thank you. to uh, turn to a time of praying intercessions but we're going to begin our intercessions by calling bands of marriage and it's uh, wonderful that we've got um, marriages and weddings coming up again and this is the first bands we've called this year actually so uh, that marks a, a really good thing and it's great to have the couple in church today as well so thank you Nick and Vicky for joining us uh, in our time of, uh, of worship and we're going to uh, call their bands for the first time now and then uh, say a prayer for them. And so I publish the bands of marriage between Nicholas Jenkinson and Victoria Ann Bellamy, both of the parish of St. Thomas with St. Stephen in SW12. And this is for the first time of asking and Victoria has a qualifying connection with St. Andrew's Framingham Earl. If any of you know any reason in law why this couple may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. O Lord our God, giver of all good things, 
We ask your blessing upon Nick and Vicky, whose lives are shortly to be joined together in marriage. May they dwell together in love and peace all the days of their life, seeking one another's welfare, bearing one another's burdens, and sharing one another's joys through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue our prayers. Lord God, we ask that you'd be with all couples who are planning or replanning perhaps their, their weddings, their marriages, and also those who have had to postpone their plans. Lord God, please remove any disappointments they, they might be feeling, and Lord, help them to focus on the important things as they prepare for a lifelong commitment to each other and before you. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Lord, we, get, we pray that you would draw close to those this day who are worried about their health in any sort of way, especially those who are worried about dying and death. Lord God, please guide them to seek first the kingdom of God, that they may know him who brings life in all its abundance, Jesus Christ. And fill their hearts, Lord, with peace and joy and love. Lord God, we pray that you would please continue to help the NHS, all the staff and doctors who work there. Help them to give the treatment and care to people who have COVID, but also to those who need treatment as well for other conditions and other illnesses. Please strengthen those who give support to others who are weak and frail or just not coping. And Lord God, guide us as a nation to give support to those nations who are least able to support themselves. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom Lord God, we pray for the well-being of our community, of our country, of our neighbours and friends and families and loved ones. And today we especially pray for those grieving the loss of someone they love. And especially, Lord, we pray you would draw close to Queen Elizabeth and her family at this time, at the loss of her husband, Philip. And we also think of others, those we know who have lost loved ones, especially in this last year, and especially in our community here, Lord. We remember today the family and friends of Dougie Mins, of Andrew Lawson, of Ralph Phipps, especially remembering Russell at this time, and of Mary Mallet and others that are not known to us. Loving Father, we also bring before you now those who need our prayers, our prayers for healing as we've just heard with, that Peter and John responded to, who need our comfort, who need our support, who need to be strengthened with your strength, not ours at this time. And Lord God, we hold these people now before you. We hold them in our hearts or we mention them now out aloud so that we can share these prayers together. For Oliver's disabled daughter.
for Sue and for Sue's friend, uh, Joan, who is fading quickly. For Tanya and her daughter. For Ken and for Nick and Heidi and for Amelia and Adelina and for Annabelle. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for answered prayer. May our hearts dance for joy. Lord, please always teach us more and more about your love to deepen our trust and our faith in you. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Lord of the church, hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever. Amen. In our prayers, we mentioned, we prayed for the Queen as she mourns the loss of her husband, uh, Philip. Philip's favorite hymn apparently was the one which we've got on the back of our white colored sheets. Uh, it was played at the beginning, I think, of the service yesterday. And uh, because of his connections to the Navy, it was one of his um, favorite ones. We're going to hear that, hear that sing, sung to us now. And we include it this morning, partly as a tribute to, to the Duke of Edinburgh, but also as a tribute to all those who just like Philip did as he was next to the Queen, are in the background and nevertheless quietly serve God and love neighbor without any fuss or fanfare. So let's, let's be thankful, let's remember with thanksgiving uh, all those who love the people around them and serve God. Let's be thankful for the common good which they do and which they achieve. Thank you. Thank you. 
Glory to God, whose power at work among us can do infinitely more than all that we can ask or conceive. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's say the words of the grace and let's say them to each other as we now leave the building and end our service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And so indeed go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of